In the name of Christ, welcome to Billings First Congregational Church on this fifth Sunday of Lent. I'm Pastor Lisa Harmon, and I am so glad you're here for this fifth Sunday in Lent. It's also a communion service. If you are joining us online, welcome. Please have bread or a grape available as we lead out this communion service. And just a note that our littles will be staying with us in service today. We have a great Time for Young at Heart planned. Um, we have activities in the back. And we do have Naomi Moyer in the, in the nursery, but she won't be here for about another 10 minutes. And so if you'd like your littles to go into the nursery, you're welcome to do that as soon as Naomi uh, arrives. Um, we have some announcements to make. First, I just want to congratulate the Native American Achievement Center at the, on the campus of Montana State University Billings for the powwow, the annual powwow that took place over this weekend. Yes, John is all thumbs up. <clears throat> A beautiful event and it blesses our community. I want to remind you that next Saturday from 9 to noon is our all church work day. So we will be beautifying our spaces, our parklet, our sanctuary, our coat closet, Jean, um, our storage room, uh, and we need your help. Tom is going to be leading us out, and so there will be pizza and a little bit of mayhem. Wherever Tom is, there usually is too. So I want to remind you that this Wednesday, April 6th, is super, super charged. <clears throat> Nadia Bowles Weber is going to be speaking at uh, Montana State University Billings uh, in Petro Hall at 7 p.m. This is a free event. Um, I know it's also choir, which is a tough thing for some of us. It is also youth group that night. From 5.30 to 7, we will be making Easter baskets and sharing those with the YWCA and Angela's Piazza and such. And so you have a real menu of things to pick from on that night. And I just wanted to remind you of that. Um, let's see, are there any other announcements? Yes. Oh, a wonderful new event is going to take place tomorrow in our pocket park. Tomorrow, Monday... Um, from 4 to 6 p.m. in our intertribal community park. And it is going to be led out by Reverend Cheryl Stewart. And we will write prayers for the planet and make origami paper cranes. And so we hope that you will stop by tomorrow, Monday, from 4 to 6, in this manifestation of prayer and demonstration uh, that demonstrates our love for the planet. And so thank you, Cheryl, for leading us out in that way. We hope that this is a recurring thing, correct? Awesome. Are there any other announcements at this time? Okay. We begin, oh, no, there are. <clears throat> I take that back. We have a few new songs in our service today, and I want to bring your attention to them in the bulletin. Our <clears throat> first one is Take, Oh, Take Me As I Am, and it is during our communion our invitation to the table, you'll see that in the inside of your bulletin on page two. And we're going to go over it. We're going to sing through it with William. So um, it, it, it's, it starts with take, oh, take me as I am. And a little further down, you'll see holy, holy God of hosts. Christ has died, yet Christ is risen. It's the same tune. And then when everybody comes up for the bread and the grape, we're going to keep singing, take, oh, take me as I am, until everybody has the bread and grape. So let's practice that now. <clears throat> take, oh, take me as I am. Thank you so much. And we are adjusting to <clears throat> a couple of new microphones, so 
We appreciate your patience. Our second song that I'd like to bring to your attention is on the back of the bulletin. If you turn to the back. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's called The Lord Went to a Dinner. And it is so perfect for our scripture reading today. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was written by Carolyn Gillette, you'll see uh, in, the, uh, in the notes on your bulletin. And I was able to speak with Carolyn, and she gave us permission to use this song in our service today. So I'm very excited. When we come to sing that song, Steve is going to play it through the tune one time for us. It is um, sung to the tune of, Oh Jesus, I Have Promised, which is in our New Century Hymnal, number 493. Awesome. I think that those are all the notes that I have for you all today. And excuse my frogginess. Um, I, we're just going to have to work through it today. But I have water. So, um, awesome. We begin our service recognizing that we worship on the unceded sacred homelands of Crow, Northern Cheyenne, Sioux, and Blackfeet people. This land is part of the Elk River watershed. We honor the elders of this land past and present and acknowledge the many, many generations that came before us. We repent of the violence and genocide perpetuated against indigenous peoples everywhere in the name of the church. May that lead us to right action, and may that lead us to worship in humility, responsibility, and grace. Let us worship our holy God. The story of Jesus includes many moments around tables, as this was part of his ritual of relationship even to the last. In this fifth week of the Lent season, we hear a story of love and devotion from the disciple Mary, directed at Jesus at the table. As we will see, Jesus tries to prepare his beloved companions for his death. Some would rather bicker, refusing or unable to accept the gravity and pain, just as we might dismiss the fragility of our lives insisting on the effortless perfection that permeates our culture and hardly makes room for a real life of joy that also includes our pain. I invite you to stand in body or spirit and join in the prayer as we call on God today. A prayer based on Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 21. Let us pray together. Creator God, you prepare a new way in the wilderness, and your grace waters the desert. Help us to recognize your hand working miracles beyond our imagining. Open our hearts to be transformed by the new thing you are doing so that our lives may proclaim the extravagance of your love for all and its presence in Jesus Christ. Amen. Please remain standing and join in our opening hymn, Guide Me, O Great Redeemer, number 18 in your new century hymnal and as provided on your screen.
till I want no more. Feed me till I Steve, you may remain standing. Jesus speaks the words no one wanted to admit. He was not always going to be around. Oh, don't say that. So many of us have said to a loved one who speaks the truth about the fragility of life, perhaps we get uncomfortable because it reveals the precious nature of the present moment, laying bare the beauty and fear in it all. Today, we'll see Jesus model strength in the midst of vulnerability. Let us ponder the fragility of our lives and the beauty that can come from sharing moments of vulnerability with each other. Let us take a moment of silent reflection. Hear this compassionate word from Paul's letter to the Philippians. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If I somehow, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Know already, beloved in Christ, that God is offering us freedom from the need to avoid suffering at the cost of denying the fullness of life. We are invited into the knowledge that Christ's vulnerability in life and death and resurrection shows us the sacred nature of the depths and the heights of sorrow and joy in our lives. And no, despite our meanderings and sometimes failings, and faltering steps in the name of Christ, you are valued and treasured and beloved. Praise God. Amen. And you may be seated. We're going to do the peace of Christ a little bit differently. I had invited um, Jordan Manga to join us. He is from Big Sky Event Services, and he, at the last minute, is unable to join us. But I was wondering if Carrie might be willing to come forward for a moment and certainly bring little beautiful Bennett. So we have been a part of a ministry since December 30th when Carrie Boyder called me. I was in Kalispell for Christmas with my grandchildren and Carrie who has been working very hard on the issue of Um, people experiencing homelessness, the unhoused in our city for a very long time. Hi, Bennett. It's so good to see you. Hi, Carrie. And Carrie asked if our church would be willing to be the site for an emergency overflow shelter for the crisis center. And I said, let me check with Nate, our moderator, but I'm I'm pretty sure the answer is yes from a church like ours. In a time like that, it was minus four degrees. And since that day, Carrie made an incredible plan with the continuum of care, with the housing, uh, HRDC, and many, many other partners in the community for a program that would work to serve the unhoused in our community when the crisis center was full. And today is the last day of that (coughs) ministry in our building. And I invited Jordan Manga, who is the uh, project manager or director of um, 
Big Sky Event Services and his staff. They have been here for the first probably, I don't know, week. Carrie and I showed up every single night. Bennett showed up as well to make sure that people knew how to move about the building and that, that people were adequately cared for. And so during this time of peace of Christ, when we say that we are the hands and the feet of a loving and compassionate God, we have people like Carrie and Jordan Manga and his staff who have done a mighty work in our midst. And so I just want to thank you, Carrie. Thank you so much. And you're welcome to say a word if you'd like. I could get a, a microphone. Would you like to say a word? Um, can you all hear me? We could get you this I microphone right here. But um, for folks at home, sure. if you'd like oh, to. That's true. Yeah, why don't you just step right in here and use this microphone? You know, we do things on the fly here. Yeah. At Billings sorry. First Church. No, sorry. Not at all. Please. I just want to thank all of you as a congregation. Um, this place is so special, and it's really great to be part of it as my family to be part of it, to have had my son baptized here, but to know that it's a place I can call on for our unhoused and unsheltered neighbors in times of need. Um, if they're hungry, you all have fed them. When they need shelter, you shelter them, and this church is really special, and so I just want to thank all of you for making this church what it is um, and being willing to step up in the hard times um, when we don't always know how it's going to come together and work out. Um, praise God it did, and, and thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, and can we all just thank Carrie, Jordan, Manga, and his staff, and um, let's all just send some love and peace to Bennett. Oh, thank you. You're, oh, you're welcome. And the peace of Christ with you, Carrie. Thank you so much for your ministry in our midst. The peace of Christ with all of you. And please take a moment to share the peace of Christ with those around you. Yes, the peace sign. Um, I don't know the other thing that we did. What does this mean there? The force be with you. No, live long and prosper to those online. Peace, Morgan and Mo, Brad in the back, Steve, peace. And William, peace to you as well. Thank you so much, Carrie. And now <clears throat> we come to a time where we invite the littles to come forward. So Bennett, would you come back up here? And Varick and Charlie <clears throat> and Makari. Oh, my gosh. Here you are. Oh, yay. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Bennett. Come on up. We're going to sit right here. Hey, Jojo, how you doing? Oh, right on. Let's have a seat. I want to talk to you today. Isn't that a wonderful waterfall? Yay. Well, it is the season of Lent, and do you know what the color? I'm so glad, Varric. Yeah, it really is. And it, yep, it's going to be there, too, for a few more minutes, too. <clears throat> hey, Varric, do you know what the color of Lent, the color of the Lenten season is? Charlie? It's not orange, it is purple, purple, that's right. And purple is the color of repentance. And do you remember what repentance means? Do you remember what the word repent means? Do you remember something we did last week when the congregation said it's the season of Lent and we, we turn around, that's right, that's right. And today we're going to talk about, we've been moving through our Lenten series. We're journeying with, with Jesus through the wilderness. But I want, to, I want to talk to you about something really special today. I brought some pretty cool things. This is a little clementine. And can you, can you smell that? Take a smell. Can you smell that? Charlie, can you smell? Do you know what that smell is? Bennett, do you want to smell this? My mom used to make these, and it's called a pomander. We would take an orange, smell that, and we would press cloves into it. And what makes it easier is when you're starting yourself. Here, would you hold that for me, Varric? So what, what my mom would do is poke a hole in the orange, and then we would stick a clove in the orange, and we would make these pomanders, and she would put a ribbon We'd hang it on the Christmas tree. Does anybody remember that? And we would also, or just put it on a plate in our house and make the house smell good. Well, we're going to try in just a minute, but I want to tell you a story about the clove. The clove is a spice, and we use it for cooking, and we use it for making chai tea, and we use it for 
um, making our house smell so wonderful. But do you know what else it does? If you use the oil of a clove, it, it, it numbs your skin. It acts as an anesthetic and an antiseptic. Have you ever been to the dentist and smelled cloves, anyone? Yeah, it's something called eugenol. Eugenol, did you know that? Smell that. So, I have not had that at all. You haven't had that at all? I'm really glad because we normally would use it for root canals. And we don't want that. So I used to work in a dental office. You might not know that. I was a dental assistant. I got a one-year degree in dental assisting. And we used to use eugenol, the oil of the clove, to numb people when they had pulpitis, which is an inflammation of the pulp in the tooth. But why am I telling you this? Is because today in our scripture reading, Mary of Bethany takes an essence of oil called spikenard, and it is in the honeysuckle family. I want you to smell this oil. And it relieves pain. And it's an anti... Do you want to, do you want to smell it? No? Do you want to smell it? Smell that. What is it? it smells like flowers, doesn't it? Can you smell that? Bennett, do you want to smell it too? Yeah. So it's an anointing oil. And what happened is... Um, our Jewish brothers and sisters would prepare someone for burial by using oils like this. And Mary of Bethany knew this was the oil to use. And so today, I just wanted to show you all the exciting things. Look at all of my oils here that you can use. Some so that you wake up in the morning. It smells like tangerines. Some if you get a cut and it hurts, you can put in oil. And in our story today, uh, let me tell you something. Mary of Bethany, she takes a very expensive vial of spikenard, and she breaks that vial, and she washes Jesus' feet because she knows that he's not going to be around for a very long time. I think Mary was a medicine woman, and she knew exactly what she was doing. And she is really modeling for us how we're to be with each other. Yeah. But Jesus can actually he, from the dead. He did. He rose from the dead. And what we're doing right now is walking through Jesus' story. And we cannot wait to get to the other side of that story, which we call Easter, when he rises from the dead. It's an incredible story. You do. Yeah, that's where we have family and gathering time. So what I want you all to do is take... Tell me. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That's the part I like too where I get chocolate bunny and Easter egg. Yeah, I get that totally. Yeah. You really like that part of Easter? Yeah, I get it. Yeah. I like that part of Easter the most. Do you like that part of Easter the most? Yeah. Well, we celebrate that too, and we celebrate you here. Everyone, take a clementine and remember just the power that comes from creation and the earth and how it heals us. Bennett, would you like one? Come and have a I clementine. Like you do? Good. All right, let's get connected because remember, if we're going to make it in the world, we have got to get connected and speak with a strong voice, right? So can we all get connected in some way? I'm going to come up here. Let's all come to the top row, and we're going to all sit here, and I'm going to touch feet with Makari, and I'm going to touch feet with Bennett, and with Varick. Scoot over just a little bit, and let us all pray together. Ready? Loving God, thank you. From the gifts, from the land, for friendship, and your grace, your grace and, your mercy. and your mercy. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming up, you guys. And if you'd like to share a clementine with someone else, take one, please. They are so yummy. Bennett, you take one for your mom, maybe? Yeah? All right. And you can go back to your seats. Naomi is here for those that would like to go into the nursery. And for those that would like to stay, you can stay as well. You ready? Come on, Varick, let's go. Let's go, Bennett. Yeah, you like oranges too? Yeah. Me too. Those are great treats. What a story. The oil of clove, eugenol. Who knew, right? To this day, still using those healing properties 
in those essential oils that we have. And we're going to hear about Mary today. Thank you for coming forward. Our first scripture reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 15, verses 7 through 11. If there is among you anyone in need, a member of your community in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand, willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. Be careful that you do not entertain a mean thought, thinking the seventh year, the year of remission is near, and therefore view your needy neighbor with hostility and give nothing. Your neighbor might cry to the Lord against you, and you would incur guilt. Give liberally, and be ungrudging when you do so, for on this account the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth. I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. And now for our special music, I would ask that we use this time as a, a time of meditation and reflection and prayer, our prayers of the people today in this communion service. And it is lovingly led out by William and our choir. Let us come into that spirit of meditation and prayer. and his staff as they've led out our beautiful ministry in our church. We pray for Carrie and her days going forward. We pray for Reverend Mark and Reverend Cheryl Stewart in their grief in the loss of their dear friend, Reverend Bruce. We pray for Lita Pepione as she reunites with her sister. Feel free to call out the prayers on your heart. We pray for our planet. We pray for our church.
Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, choir, for leading us in prayers of the people. You may be seated. Our second scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus, Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure spikenard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. A word of God that is still speaking. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Let us pray again. Prepare our hearts, O God, not to receive my thoughts, but to hear your voice. Meet us at our greatest point of need and till the soil of our souls. Amen. In 2006, I attended a community meeting where Philip Mangano, the then executive director of the Interagency Council on Homelessness, had come to Billings from Washington, D.C. to talk about writing a 10-year plan to end homelessness. The meeting was attended by over 100 people, at least, representing, for the most part, local social service providers. As Mr. Mangano was speaking about cities across the United States that were mobilizing and writing these plans, a man stood up from one of our shelters and said, but if you end homelessness, I'm out of a job. And my jaw dropped. What? Isn't that the goal, to create safe and appropriate housing for the unhoused, that homelessness might be temporary? And is it not true, as we hear in both our scripture readings today, that the poor will always be among us? There are many factors that contribute to the reasons a person might experience life on the streets. For example, addiction, poverty, systemic racism, the effects of colonization, mental health struggle, and until we have a completely reordered society or structures in place that address these factors in permanent, supportive, and restorative ways, and or until we eradicate systemic injustice, this is an ongoing call. A call to serve the poor until there is no need among us. As Moses says in Deuteronomy, until there is no poor among us, which is God's ultimate vision for society and our ongoing call in the daily. And in the midst of that ongoing call, we are to tend to our lives and our loves as well. Something we see played out today in a story of great empathy and devotion, empowerment and courage. This is the fifth week of Lent, the last before Holy Week begins. We've been traveling with Luke so far, but this week we turn to the Gospel of John for the story of the anointing at Bethany. Bethany is just outside Jerusalem on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives. As John tells it, the jubilant hosannas of Palm Sunday are about to ring out. But first, in our story, Lazarus' sister Mary seems to fully grasp before anyone else 
That even as Jesus prepares for his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, he is also preparing for his death. As such, she is moved, washes his feet, and anoints them with spikenard. Spikenard is an expensive oil derived from a flowering plant in the honeysuckle family. It was used not only by the Jews, but, of course, many peoples from the Middle East and Asia. It was imported from the areas of present-day India, China, and Nepal as the plant is native to the Himalayas. The ancients used it to season food. They used it for medicinal purposes as a perfume and to prepare bodies for burial. Today, some hospice givers, caregivers and end-of-life doulas use spikenard to help patients emotionally transition from life to death. It has been shown to relieve stress and anxiety and therefore calm the body and the mind. I have used it in my pastoral care. It is fragrant. And among many other things, it lessens the sensitivity of nerves to pain. Lazarus' sister Mary, this medicine woman from Bethany, surely knows that it lessens the sensitivity of nerves to pain. And anticipating the suffering of Jesus as one might anticipate for a revolutionary figure that speaks against the powers of the day, Mary offers it to Jesus intuitively, lovingly, lavishly, and is immediately criticized by Judas Iscariot for doing so. He rebukes her saying, what are you doing? Do you know how expensive that is? That's a year's worth of wages. Do you know how many poor people we could have helped with that? I've asked myself why Judas would criticize Mary for serving Jesus in this way. Is he wholly centered on the money as alluded to in the story? That in putting money in the common purse that he held, the common purse for the poor, that he would then have access to that common purse? Is he asserting his dominance in the hierarchy of things? A woman with her hair down touching Jesus' feet? Unthinkable. Is he communicating the fear among the disciples who's, who are afraid to admit the reality of loss and the journey of pain that they will invariably travel with Jesus? Is he jealous of the relationship between Mary and Jesus in that moment and wants to disrupt that moment? Does he resent the way it shows his inability to be empathic in the midst of suffering? This is a moment of great vulnerability in Jesus' life as he comes face to face with his looming death. I have wondered how I would want those last moments in my life to be. Would I want the company of family and friends, a shared meal, stories told, music, fragrance, touch. When my mom was first diagnosed with cancer, I remember the doctor not being really clear about my mom's prognosis. There was an elephant in the room that we weren't talking about. I felt that we were not getting all the information we needed. Ultimately, I think the doctor was reluctant to talk about death and dying something I am sure he worked hard to avoid for people in their families. It's something we make little room for to discuss in our culture, and yet it's a part of life. As a result of this, I was having a hard time grasping the reality of my mom's condition. Finally, <clears throat> on a lunch break one day, I called his office and asked for more clarity around my mom's condition and prognosis. He said that he was sorry but that she had three to six months to live. I think that is important information to know when you're living with and loving a life in the midst of illness. In the midst of terminal illness or any illness for that matter, and COVID has certainly demonstrated that for so many of us, our lives are fragile. The sense of the fragility of life is never more present than when death is called to mind or present in front of us. <clears throat> It makes every minute of every hour a precious thing. It makes saving that bottle of champagne for a special occasion seem ridiculous. It makes saving the good china for some day stupid. It makes you want to pack picnic lunches on Monday and take Sunday drives on Tuesday. 
It makes you rethink how you spend your time and your energy. And it can even make you want to crack the seal of an alabaster vial of expensive oil and rub it on the feet of someone you love, that they might be comforted, that they might their pain might be lessened, that the fragrance might linger as they journey, reminding them of the love and the courage that comes from friendship and kinship and the land and creator. In our story, this is a moment where Jesus is staring his inevitable death in the face, and we find Mary, where she had been before, learning from her rabbi, delighting in his words and works, Here she is again at his feet saying, I have entered your joy and now will enter your pain. And she is welcome there. Jesus accepts from Mary that he is worthy to be cared for, that he is worthy of being nurtured, honored, celebrated, just as he is in that very moment. And it is for us to learn from Mary's foreshadowing through the washing of the feet and her discipleship. It is for us to learn from the beauty of Jesus' vulnerability and how one nourishes the other in this scene and then back again and again. It is for us to remember that this scene takes place in the house of Lazarus, whose return to life must feel dramatically fresh. A blessed assurance that as we enter Holy Week, awaiting new life on the other side of the tomb, In a culture that prizes polished pictures of perfection, that edits out wrinkles and cracks, that superimposes filters on the fabric of life so that there's no trace of vulnerability or weakness here, we have the most exemplary model of how we might acknowledge our fragility and extend grace and mercy. And we have that modeled in a poor woman who gives everything she has and pours it out to wash the dirty, tired, worn feet of a man who has long walked and must walk further still. And even, and yet... In the midst of this tender moment, as Jesus is thirsting to receive from Mary's open-handed and open-hearted love, he is quick to admonish Judas for mansplaining, criticizing and trying to disempower Mary of Bethany. He shuts Judas down, and what does he say? He says, leave her alone. Giving to and loving the poor is not a one-off, Judas. It's an every day until there is no more. Let us serve each other without hesitation and with abandon. Jesus is all right with me. Praise God. Amen. And now we come to a time where we bring our gifts and our tithes before God. I want to thank you heartily for supporting the ministries and the good work of our church so that we can extend that beautifying, redeeming love of God's realm in the world. There are many ways to give, and I'm sure Mo and Morgan are going to put those up on your screen, and Brad will now pass the plate.
Generous God, in light of your extravagant blessings, no matter what the state of our world or our imperfect lives, we offer our gifts and ourselves and know that you transform what we plant into the produce of love. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brad. You may be seated. And now we come to the sacrament of Holy Communion. I invite Joyce to come forward and help me today. <clears throat> Joyce is going to help me move this table and accompany me during this sacred time, this blessed sacrament. Joyce, I think we'll move the table right out here. Would you help me? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Please take a look at your communion liturgy. Joyce, let me get you a... You're welcome. <clears throat> welcome to the table where everyone is invited. Christ looks upon each one with love and says, You are welcome at my table. Christ looks upon each one with compassion and says, Whatever troubles you, bring it here. Christ looks upon each one with grace and says, whatever you'd like to leave behind, do it here. Will you come? Will you bring your troubles? Will you shed all that is unnecessary in your life? This is the place where you need not be perfect. You need not be sure of yourself or your faith. You need not feel whole and right in the world. Jesus invited many to his tables, and in doing so, he assured them of their place in the illogical reign of love and grace. He just wanted them to be hungry for relationship, hungry to look across the table into another's eyes, to break open their lives and lift a cup in the midst of hard times. And here, this is for all, and so this is for you, beloved. <clears throat> can join us. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be, set your seal upon my heart, and live in me. The holy living God be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful and playful thing anytime and everywhere to give thanks to you. You created this world full of so much beauty and sorrow and called it good and called it enough. Although we feel lost at times, you are ever present. We doubt, resist, turn away and rage, insistent on our own power to pull us through and yet sure that we are to blame, making life seem like a confusing paradox. But you, you are patient. You are here to meet us, reside with us in strange and alienating times, always faithful, always present in this body, in this body. And so together we proclaim the praise-filled truth of your glory along with the saints. Our 
love, second verse. Holy, holy God of hosts, heaven and earth sing out your name. Blessed are they who come today and take your place. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. He proclaimed freedom for the bound, justice for the oppressed, grace for the lost, and love for the prodigal. Though the life and ministry, through the life and ministry of Jesus, we can imagine and live into a community where all who struggle are taken into loving arms and those who struggle to love are invited into greater compassion. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you. He broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, again, giving you thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> and so we remember. We offer ourselves. We proclaim God's time. Christ has died, yet Christ has risen. Christ will come once again. We remember and proclaim redeeming love. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. Make them be for us sustenance for our days, love for simple, ordinary, holy as is lives, fuel for justice in this world. By your spirit, open us to each other. Open us to our world, making us one in you through Christ, in the power of your amazing grace. Amen. I invite you to come forward pew by pew. We'll sing this same last verse until everyone has bread and grape. Return to your seats, and then we'll take it together. Take, oh, take me as I am. Some man out, but I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. like gluten-free, let me know. Take, oh, take, take me, me as, as I am. Some am out what I should be. The bread Set of life. Set your seal upon my heart the bread and of live life. in me. And take, the bread of life. Oh, take me as I am. Some and out what I should be. Susan, the bread of life. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. The bread of life, John. Sue, the bread of life. And take, oh, take me as I am. Some and out what I should be. Set the your of life seal here. upon my heart and live in me. Margie, the bread of life. Cheryl, the bread of life. Take, oh, take me as the I am. Some and out what I should be. Dixie, the bread of life. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Bread of life. Take the bread of life. Macari, 
Take and eat the bread of life. Take and drink the cup of life. <clears throat> Let us pray. Holy One, we thank you for the gift and grace of your table, for the gift and grace of your nourishing and abiding love. In this sacrament, we have taken you into our beings and into our lives, your love and compassion, your gentleness and justice. In our gratitude, we pray that we might now be these things in the world that make a true good, as is life. Thank you for the grace which allows us to take up the journey of sharing bread wherever we may be on the road. Let us forever know your presence in front of us, beside us, within us, as we seek to be faithful. Amen. Thank you, Joyce, very much. Thank you all. Thank you, choir. Thank you, William. And now, you may stand and body your spirit for our closing hymn. Remember, it's a little different. It's on the back of your bulletin. It is to the tune of O oh, Jesus, I Have Promised, which is in your New Century hymnal. Steve is going to play it through one time for us. There are four verses.
Jesus. Please remain standing for a blessing and the benediction. Blessed are you, dear, dear one, doing this holy work of suffering what must be suffered, of grieving what has been lost, of knowing the unthinkable truth that must be known. This grief can make you feel on the other side of the glass from the whole world around you, a force field of different realities separating you, yet blessed are you in yours, for yours is the one most seen by God who breathes compassion upon you even now, who has walked this path and who leans toward you, gathering you up in the arms of love. Rest now, dear one. You are not alone. And now, may the God who loves all of creation, especially the grief-stricken parts, and Jesus, our companion, along this crooked path called life, and the Holy Spirit who loves to improvise in surprising ways, go with you, dwell among you, and give you joy. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.